to another episode of Storytime with Chantastic, where we learn about the craft of modern UI development. Today, I have an awesome guest, Ryan Bayhan, and we're talking about developer experience, particularly developer experience at Shopify. Um, now, we have a really great relationship um, at Storybook with Shopify. Um, in fact, uh, you know, recently you might have learned that, uh, you know, Storybook became like five times faster, kind of like overnight. And that's really uh, a large part um, due to Shopify, their experience building huge storybooks and uh, bringing that back and uh, kind of showing us how things could be better. Um, so really excited today to talk with Ryan uh, about all the cool things that they're doing over there and um, how they look at building modern UIs. Uh, so Ryan, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's a huge honor. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about uh, your role at Shopify right now and uh, kind of like what, what your team does um, and what you're looking to improve. Yeah, for sure. So I'm a front-end developer on the app developer experience team. Uh, the team overall is pretty new, like two months old or something like that. And I'm even newer to it. But basically, um, we are looking at how people build on top of Shopify. My team specifically looking at how people build apps on top of Shopify, either privately or publicly for the App Store, and how we can make that experience as seamless and ergonomic and all the, the fancy words to say good uh, <laughs> as possible. Now, there's been a lot of talk recently about user experience and developer experience and kind of like what the what the focus should be and it seems like mm -hmm. a lot of times you know like it, there, there's not like a cut and dry answer right like just like you know you should always focus on user experience or you should always focus on developer experience and especially in roles like ours like our job is to focus on developer experience right to make sure that developers are able to like quickly provide great user experiences I, i'm curious like what what that looks like in your particular role, how you think about that, uh, how you communicate communicate that to teams and kind of like build the best um, tools that you can. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, like UX and DX just both keep going up uh, and are in perfect <laughs> harmony. Obviously, they can't always be true. Um, but I think working at Shopify, like number one, like we want to prioritize having the best merchant experience possible so like if anything is at the behest of our users like that is pretty much a no-go um but in terms of creating tooling for developers um it can be finicky right because there's a lot of opinions <laughs> and a lot of uh, divergent yeah. <laughs> opinions but um we try to like practice dog fooding as much as possible so like we use cool. all of our own tools as much as possible um and i think that's probably the main loop that we tend to look at is like okay we've come out with this new thing we're using it internally we're going to push that forward internally as much as possible like as often as possible i love that i love that when you get to the scale of shopify do you have a lot of kind of like unified tools or is it you know like this team works to support tooling for this part of you know the shopify experience mm -hmm. yeah so there have been a lot there's a lot of internal movement around these things teams like shifting and, and moving around but generally there's some level of infra that people are focused on the internal tooling specifically or on specific verticals that they look at and then um, it sort of stays in that lane so like a good example is our new cloud environment there's an entire team managing that and it's basically like a mini company inside of shopify and they are focused nice. on how can we get the best cloud environments possible so that people can spin up whatever repo configuration they need to and it just works and it's fast and um, yeah, just the best it can be, I guess. Yeah, 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 I love that. Now, something that we'd talked about a little bit, you know, we've, we've had the benefit of being able to kind of like uh, knock ideas back and forth as we've been talking about this is um, you have this really powerful language, um, I think, around um, unnecessary artifacts. And I'd love to kind of get into what that means, like right at the top of this. Um, because I think a, a lot of times, one of the challenges in having like really clear lanes um, in your teams is that you end up kind of working in isolation and then like hoping that like, 
if we work in isolation and you work in isolation, we can kind of like, you know, connect the dots later. And um, I'm curious, you know, as you have like, you know, built out, you know, built out these teams, built out this tooling and whatnot, how do you, um, how do you think about the way that people should be working together um, and collaborating across development and design? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's, in my opinion, like the hardest problem that we face <laughs> is actually getting people from, uh, you know, product and design and eng to be like speaking the same language and working on the thing. Um, I think especially in the remote world, it's really easy to get in a habit of like products going to write some docs over here. Figma or uh, sorry, designers are going to like use Figma over here and then engineers are going to like write code in some way or another, whether that be a design system or even like writing uh, stories like without consulting the other groups. And what you end up with is, yeah, a lot of artifacts, but that artifact itself is not the product for one. And then for two, like the the talent of a designer is not like making Figma mocks and the talent of a product person is not Google Docs or like how many like forms of documentation they can write. It's their product sensibility. It's their design sensibility. And I think maybe some of it just comes from like nerves of like, I need something to show people that I'm working on. But ultimately those artifacts like can be constraining at a certain point where like mm -hmm in an ideal world, or at least in my ideal world, we all work on the thing itself and we're building the thing and, and molding the actual product together rather than creating artifacts and passing those off. And then someone else interprets that artifact and builds. And eventually like there's a chain of it and you get to building a product, but you know, what are the chances that it's like, wait, that's not what I thought it was going to be. That is so, it, it, it's so fascinating because I think that we've all been in environments where, you know, I think we do enjoy the protection of having our own, um, like, outputs, right? Like, we all agree on the outcome, right? The outcome yeah. is like, okay, we need to have like a really great like user experience, like to our customers, right? Like that's at the end of the day. But it's funny how organizations have a way of rewarding just raw output, uh, where you know, okay, well, we, we as a department, like a sub department need to do this thing. And so our output is like this type of documentation. And we, it's funny because we talk about documentation as being like a really good thing. Right. And I, I think most teams could be well served by getting two really great documentation, but it's funny, like hearing you talk about like almost like over documentation as a problem. Um, how are some of the ways that you kind of experience that when you're trying to do those, those handoffs? Like, do you see like pain points across teams as you're, you know, as you have maybe like over documentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think a simple example is just the fact that like a Figma file must be recreated in code. Right. So that's mm -hmm. like one form of over documentation in a way where like, if you, like, let's say I'm working in storybook and I'm working on a story and I just am writing a component and having a designer say, no, it should be this way. No, it needs to look like this. These are the, these are the things we, we want to get to. We've like already eliminated like some duplication there just by nature of collaborating on the thing rather than handing off pieces to an outcome. Um, I think another sort of challenge with doc, like early on project briefs and discovery phases is it's really easy to say things that make sense, but you haven't actually discovered the problem you're trying to solve yet. So like you're writing a project brief and it's like, oh, this needs to be more detailed. So I will write details. And I think sometimes it can just get easy to lose the plot. I mean, even in Shopify, we changed, we use uh, our own little framework called GSD, um, which is, yeah, just get shit done. And um, <laughs> nice. it used to be, um, discovery, exploration, and builds were the three phases. And they actually changed even the language to um, proposal, prototype, and build, where it's like, you have an idea, write down, like, I want to explore it. If you get the sign off, then like prototype, that's the main portion we want to be in, like less uh, writing upfront and more doing. And then once you get to a certain phase, I think it makes a ton of sense to 
document things. I think there's some things that should probably be documented all the time, like having a decision log I found to be super, super helpful of like, we've decided this on this day. And then typically after a couple of months, like half of those decisions have been reversed for one reason or another and then reversed. <laughs> but um, like keeping track of what you've done and why I think is super important, but projecting into these are the things we're solving before you even have really dug into the meat of the the challenge can be sort of dangerous because you write things that make a ton of sense to everybody and then six months later you're looking at what you wrote and you're like why didn't like we see this thing and it's like well because we were thinking about something without doing or like looking into the active part of it interesting now i'm curious could you so i think i got the second part of that the the proposal uh prototype and build what was the kind of the the ori original idea I believe it was discover, explore, build. Okay. Interesting. It's funny because like those things sound actually like pretty similar, um, but obviously there's a lot of nuance in the in in the change. Um, I have had like really similar experiences with this as well, where you know everyone you, you get everyone kind of on the same page or like in the same meeting room and everyone talks and they talk at this really high level about like what it could be and like what it should be and you know some of the 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 theoretical roadblocks into getting it into a certain way or whatnot and everyone walks away with like different ideas of what that means and it feels like no matter what your discipline is whether it's you know design or development or you know pming um once you actually sit down with that idea, it's almost immediate that you're like, oh, actually, this doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, it's like, um, like, if you have a band, you can get people together in a room and write songs. Or like, you know, you could, I could write down like, okay, like, it's going to be in the key of A minor, and then hand it to somebody else. And they're gonna be like, and it's going to be like four, four, and then hand it to somebody else. <laughs> And that's like best case scenario of like we're all engineers so like if you even like extract that to like cross functional work it's like me saying okay it's going to be a minor and i wrote that in spanish and then hand it to someone who like speaks a little bit of spanish and then they write it in german and hand it to the next person and you get these games of telephone where like we're using similar words and what's in our mind is like drastically different right yeah. so like actually getting people together and like exploiting that we're better when we're all like we're more than the sum of our parts and like sort of getting that creative juice flowing i think is like so interesting and definitely more challenging in a remote world in a lot of ways because yeah. you know you can't actually get people in the same room so how do you mimic that but yeah i think just avoiding those sort of like silos that produce work but like what is the actual work we're producing and can we direct that to like the the ultimate product like can all the work sort of funnel into the thing we actually build rather than abstractions of the thing that we build yeah i love the way that you you, you bring uh music into it you know and i'm always fascinated by the uh kind of like the lifestyles or the extracurriculars of any person who's you know bringing this because i think there's a lot of really cool metaphors to be drawn from other disciplines and other practices and um hobbies and I love that you bring music into this because it really does, when you start thinking about it from the perspective of a band writing a song, it makes it almost kind of absurd sounding, right? Like, you know, when you think about it from a music perspective, it's like you really have to like all be in the same room to like riff off each other. And like, yeah, you're playing different instruments, but like everything has a piece. And when you're together, it's a lot easier to figure out where those pieces like fit in and like make those quick decisions about, you know, what it needs to be. But then, designing music from the abstract is like really like it's really hard to even conceptualize like how you would make that happen and thinking about how that applies to a uh, you know dev, dev design product team is like really really interesting um, what are some ways that you have been able to with a remote you know distributed team been able to capture some of that same energy and remind people like oh hey we're we're writing a song, right? Like that's what we're getting to. Like how do we, how do we do that when we're communicating in different languages, communicate and talking about it at like a theoretical level? How do we break free of that? Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question. 
Um, the way that I've started to think more about working on my own team and, and on like cross-functional teams is like, I think when we, a lot of companies made the push to remote, there was this notion that like, well, let's do everything async now. Isn't that beautiful that we can do like every <laughs> single thing asynchronously? <laughs> and I think that there's a time and a place for synchronous and asynchronous work. And it's really important to understand the, the benefits and drawbacks of both. And yeah. to me, um, like, it's so important to be synchronous in the sort of discovery or early prototyping phases where like, we need to come up with a shared language of like, what the hell we're talking about. We need to get that like creative energy in. And once you have a shared agreement, like cross team, it's much easier to go into async work, like on like task driven stuff of like, we need a button component. It's like, great. I know how to build a button component. So like, I can go do this on my own, but deciding like what to build, I feel like just lends itself so much more to synchronous work where there's really not much of a replacement for getting everybody in, having those clarifying questions asked, making sure that like we're all on the same page firmly or, you know, as firm as you can be, I guess, <laughs> as things <laughs> sure, change. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's something that we've been exploring a bit more on our team is like, can we front load that synchronous work until we are really fairly confident that we know what we're saying to each other and then move to async for like the the well-defined portion of the work that we yeah. do <laughs> well talking about the, the the hazards of remote work um I, my, my camera decided to give up the ghost so slightly different view of me but you know ryan's still looking looking great as uh, as, as usual so i <laughs> i think we were talking about some of the, the the challenges of remote work the challenges of uh working asynchronously etc and uh i'm curious as you define those like clear guidelines up front, you you know you know exactly what you're going to be doing. How do you um, kind of help teams keep the the right goal in mind, kind of that that ultimate output? Um, and how do you reward like behaviors that aren't like okay, we produce this doc, now we're done, um, or we produce this component, like now we're done. But thinking about things a little bit more holistically of like, you know, does the, you know, the, the Figma artifact match the, you know, component that we're, you know, sending to UIs and are both teams productive in building UIs, making designs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that fresh eyes are probably some of the greatest thing you can do in terms of like keeping that sense of like, did we build the thing we said we were going to? Um, and we're lucky enough, you know, at, a large company that we we tend to pop in a lot and ask people all over the org in all different roles like hey what do you think like just use this you know and just step back and it's like trying to see, gauge the reactions of like this you'll know very quickly if something makes sense or does not make sense um and this might be a bit of a stretch of a take but like if something keeps making sense and it's evolved from the original problem space i think that's overall a win rather than like hmm. we tried to solve the original problem without evolving but it doesn't make sense which is like oh no like what have we done um and then in terms <laughs> of rewarding behaviors um i think like being hyper communicative is super important and actually just like praising people and you know saying like yeah. this is fantastic work and let's keep going and um we have been using uh, storybook and chromatic a lot more to like keep especially design and product and eng in sync and that's just been really amazing in terms of one like keeping an eye on the prize and then two sort of trying to expand the sort of like literacy of all of us to understand what other people do and how they talk about the thing and how they model it in their own minds because i think like like we all love the 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 unicorn in tech that's like you can do all of these things and that's a lot less likely like you can't there's a reason they're unicorns right because they're so hard to find <laughs> um but like what we can do is like rather than have people who are brilliant all the time at all the things is like teach each other and like just make steps yeah. towards rather than like expertise or fluency, just like literacy levels and like being mindful to always try to 
uh, increase those and increase those in all directions too. I think as engineers, we're like, everybody should code, which is like, well, <laughs> we need to you know, go out of our way to learn the sensibilities of other domains too, because we'll be so much better for it. I love that. Yeah, I think I've always been so frustrated by that, like everyone should just learn how to code and then we'll be better collaborators mindset. Like it's, it's absolutely, absolutely backwards. And I love that you're taking an approach that, that thinks about things um, kind of across disciplines and, and, and works towards everyone being a better collaborator with, uh, with, with everyone else. Um, you mentioned cross-functional teams and I'm just kind of curious, like what, what does like a cross-functional team um, look like um, at, at Shopify? Yeah, so um, we have our different, so like inside of the app developer experience team, we have the engineers and the product folks and the design folks. And then at a lead level, they call it the like trifecta is there's a lead of each and they collaborate very deeply. Um, so that's, I guess, where I'm thinking about cross-functional teams is just people who don't do the same job that you do. So like support and everybody that goes into making um, like one subsection uh, of an org sort of uh, run. Cool, cool. Now you mentioned using Storybook and Chromatic. That's obviously something that's super interesting to me um, to see how you're using that. Uh, curious, you know, how has that shifted um, the way that uh, people deliver artifacts? Because obviously, you know, Storybook is kind of like in this middle ground where you have some, you know, live components, but then also you can, you know, you know, work with, you know, Figma and integrate some of that kind of stuff there, um, as well as, uh, you know, putting documentation in that in that place as well. How has that helped you kind of focus on the the ultimate outcome? Yeah, so I think that Shopify is in a really interesting place because we have tools that are like extremely complementary to Storybook that allow us to do some really interesting things. Um, so for example, I mentioned our cloud environment before. Um, now, because we have like all our work in the cloud, I can actually like SSH in and run Storybook and then have like a live link that I can share with anybody and then in real time make changes and it'll hot refresh on both of our sides. So that has like nice. been something that's pretty amazing in terms of prototyping and that in conjunction with Polaris, our design system means that like for front end people, it's almost as fast to do something in Figma as it is to do it in code. Because it's like, I have these components I can just pull in wow. and be like, okay, like how can we experiment with this? Like what if we had, you know, uh, two up of cards and just like, you know, a couple seconds later, we're not working with network requests or anything super complicated. So we can just sort of like move really, really quickly in the prototyping space. And yeah, um, ideally, get to functioning code that's, you know, 60% of the way there when we need to, to hook it up to something else. Um, so that's been really, really interesting. And actually, like, we have our sort of like, real stories where they're all co-located with the components, but then exploring like a prototypes folder where like, this is just for things that aren't hooked up to anything yet, throw some like page level decorators on. So it looks like, you know, like the app, the the admin or partners or whatever repo you're in, mm -hmm. and then just sort of like jam on things. And in real time, like can get suggestions, change. And then while that's going on too, like design and product, people can actually like fiddle with the controls and be like, hmm, like, which, you know, for one is improving the product we're building. And for two, like they're actually increasing their like react sort of component architecture literacy because they're messing yeah. with props and they now understand how these things work. So. That's been one thing that I think we've been really interested in sort of like exploiting and seeing how far we can like push that forward. This is totally fascinating to me um, because there is this concept of kind of like get out of the building, right? Which I think uh, mirrors to what you're talking about with prototyping, right? Where you can, you get to some type of clickable interactive thing that you can kind of hand to anyone you know, whether it be, you know, just your partner in the other room or, you know, a, a colleague from another company or legitimately someone who's, you know, just kind of like interested in, you know, beta products at, at, at Shopify. And I think sometimes people get kind of caught in this, this mindset of, you know, storybook being 
the like end all be all like this beautiful place of like all our you know like hard and fast components or pages or whatnot and don't always use it in the way that you're describing which is like in addition to that this is also our playground where we're like running experience experiments kind of like working through problems etc cetera, etc cetera. and so i find that really fascinating um i'd love to learn more about how you're using using it for that like how you um, how you think about kind of like jumping in and prototyping out a new idea using the components in that library. Yeah, for sure. It's something that's very like new to us too. So I think we're still learning yeah. a lot along the way. And I think the, the, the trap that's most important to avoid there is to like not get caught up in fidelity. Like you, there's definitely a space for pen and paper or just like my my favorite thing is just like divs with borders and it's like this right you know the black border <laughs> represents this um but yeah i think our our basic setup is like making sure that like we have msw to mock any sort of network request that might interrupt us mm -hmm. and then um i've been messing more with the links add-on as well to sort of like pseudo prototype between different places um but i I guess my best answer for now is it's been pretty fast and loose with just sort of like composing different quick ideas together. Sometimes it is just divs and like it's it's pretty mock level. Um, but but yeah, I think there's a ton of room to to think through that aspect of prototyping that I'm super bullish on and something that I'm very excited to explore. Yeah, for sure. Now in these experiments do you actually commit those and kind of iterate those like on those in uh github or is it or not whatever you're using uh you know as uh for git um but is that something that you commit and then continue to iterate on until like kind of it moves into a different section that's maybe more uh you know, you know finished um or is that something that you're just using kind of like as a prototyping space and it doesn't actually land until it's done yeah, we have committed them before. I think that's probably the pattern we've cool. used most is like having some directory, having sometimes multiple um, like sort of prototypes in the same stories file, sometimes having different prototypes in different stories file, but almost scaffolding something that resembles like how you'd go about using a beta flag as you iterate through things, but rather than having mm -hmm. some sort of feature flag or, or beta flag, which, you know, a lot of times it's like extra conditionals in a bunch of places. It just lives on its own <laughs> yeah. until we've sort of hashed out like the way that everything should work. And then, you know, basically copy pasting chunks as needed of like, okay, like we figured out this thing now. Um, if it's at a micro level, then it's just like, all right, like let's move this component into another folder and, and flip the switch and we're sort of ready to go now. Um, or probably still beta flags for larger things if you're getting, you know, sure. chunky with it. I love this. Uh, I love this idea of kind of like progressively getting to that stable release, but like not shying away from kind of putting the work in progress um, in your storybook. I, it, yeah, it's. I love. I love hearing that that's happening because it's something that you know I I kind of had as like a personal discipline and really enjoy seeing other people enjoy instead of thinking about it as just like this pristine you know like white glove environment where you know everything has to be very like delicate you have to treat everything very like delicately. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, one thing I wanted to come back to was the topic of a decision log. Um, that's something that, that really fascinates me. And I, I've done this a little bit in practice in personal projects, mm -hmm. but what does that look like as a team um, tracking a decision log, um, you know, versus like a, you know, a change log or a readme or like something, you know, that's maybe more common at this point. Yeah. So the way that I typically approach that when I've championed projects is it's, it's just something that lives in a project brief, like a, a typical Google doc. And, you know, I think the most important thing with the decision log is like, make sure it's decided. So like, make sure we actually all agree on this, but, um, <laughs> you know, getting a confirmation of like, okay, we're going to take this out of the scope of the project. We all agree with this. Okay, great. Like, and then, you know, here's a date stamp and uh, a summary of the decision that's made. Uh, depending on the team, you might want to actually have people take a look at the summary too, just to make sure it like all yeah. matches up. But um, yeah, keeping it super scrappy and just something to look back to because there's so much context that's lost, especially when people are on multiple projects and you know yeah. the 
the fear is like rebuilding something that you already tried and didn't work. So trying to put enough guardrails in place to avoid those sort of uh, nightmare fuel scenarios. <laughs> I, I like that too, because as a, as a team, you're kind of drawing a line in the sand as a team. And there's a lot of really interesting things that come from this, but um, like having to actually write it down kind of takes a lot of the ambiguity out of walking away with like different assumptions about what was what was decided um how do you handle moments where you've made a decision on something but then it's very clear that that isn't going to to work um tell me a little bit about like how that how that gets handled yeah for sure um so i'm a big believer that most of the time making any decision is better than making no decision so like going back on them i think is something that we should embrace more than fear like it's one thing if you've done it like five times in like three months it's like okay we need to figure out what the heck is going on here but um you know one of shopify's values is thrive on change um another is make great decisions quickly which i think a lot of people look at as like make decisions quickly um there's i don't know if someone at shopify told me this but one thing that really stuck with me was like take as much time to make as a decision as you would to be able to reverse it. So like if something can be changed really easily, then like who gives a shit? Make the call, keep moving forward. If something is really high risk and has a lot of implications for the future, that's something that we should like sort of like marinate on and figure out. Um, being okay with, um, with going back on decisions, it means you probably learn something and it's probably exposing something interesting if your decision log has you know, if it has a couple decisions that have gone back and forth, then okay, like we've prototyped, we've thought about things, we've come to different conclusions. If the core of the, pro I've seen some where the entire premise of the project has gone back and forth and it's like, maybe we don't do this at all then. Like maybe the answer is we're not ready for this, pro which I think also is a success. If you explore a project and the answer is not right now, that's good to know. Like, you know, you don't need to, it's like the, basically the sunk cost fallacy, but like you don't need to build something just because you thought about building it. Like that's a very easy trap to get caught into. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I love, I, I love these terms that you've been throwing out because I think that they're, they could really be um, helpful to a lot of people. The, uh, the idea of thriving on change, man, that is so hard for <laughs> us developer types. Like I, it's so hard. I feel like uh, designers are a little bit more excited about change, but man, developers are just like, no, like we've made that decision. Never, yeah. never again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then also like the idea of make great decisions quickly. Um, I, I like the, the way that you've teased out different types of decisions, because I think that's really important is if this is easy to back out of, then any decision is better than nothing, right? Like just, let's just do it. Um, but if it's not, then, you know, taking your time to make sure that you have the right one. And then also the, you know, kind of the last thing that you said was um, making sure that the, the project is right in the first place. And maybe a lot of flip-flopping indicates that it's not right, it, and, or maybe it's not the right time. And, man, I really love that. Um, well, hey, we've covered a lot today, and I'm really grateful for your, your, your perspective on all of this because I think that it really um, shows us how we can, even in a heavily remote environment um, where we have distributed teams, like do better at collaborating. And there's a lot of techniques um, mixed in here. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to cover before we uh, wrap things up? Um, nothing top of mind. Shopify is hiring. So if, if this sounds exciting, uh, we'd love to have you. We'd love to... Uh, you know, continue making commerce better for everyone. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm Ryan underscore Bayhan on Twitter. That's pretty much the only place that I am, but um, would love to chat for anyone at any level that uh, wants to get more involved or is just interested in, in programming in general. Awesome. Yeah. For people who are interested in um, taking up a career at Shopify, uh, where can they go? Uh, if you Google Shopify careers, it'll tell you, I don't remember offhand, so someone's <laughs> going to yell at me. Um, but no, it's all right. We'll, we'll be sure to, um, I'll, I'll get a link from you and we'll put it in the description below so that people can have a, uh, a, a quick link to it. You know, honestly, clicking's easier than, you know, saying it anyway. So yeah. maybe uh, we should make a storybook <laughs> that has a, a careers page in it. That'll be our next, uh, hiring like fancy thing. 
<laughs> oh, Ryan, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, I know I learned a lot, and I'm really, really, really excited to see um, what you do with your team um, to kind of like move more of your prototyping into um, you know storybook, Figma, working together as a team. Um, I think it's really going to be um, exciting to see. So um, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And I very much look forward to all the collaboration between Shopify and, and Chromatic moving forward. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's going to be awesome. Uh, hey, if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks so much for being here. We uh, really appreciate you. If you liked this, if you got something out of it, um, give us a thumbs up. Uh, if you didn't uh, get something out of it, I'm super sorry. Um, let us know what you'd like to learn. Uh, we're always happy to uh, find out what you'd like to know and uh, make sure that we get some uh, interesting uh, perspectives and takes on the things that you're interested in. Uh, if you would be so kind, uh, give us a, a subscribe. Um, that helps us uh, kind of like know that you are interested in what we're doing. Uh, and we'll have more interviews like this and uh, information about releases coming up. So uh, subscribe. We're super grateful for you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye.